Gina, and welcome everyone to today's webinar, an overview of chemical notification systems in China, Taiwan, and South Korea. My name is Kay Bechtold. I'm the assistant editor of The Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all listeners for attending today's event, and especially Yordis Group for sponsoring this webinar. Don't worry, you're in the right place. Yordis Group was known as the REACH Center until earlier this month when the company rebranded to better reflect its expanded scope of services and continued international growth. Our presenter today is Sophie Guinard, a regulatory scientist at Yordis Group. Sophie joined the company in 2014. As a regulatory scientist, she supports clients to help them understand and comply with chemical regulations in Asia and the European Union. She has experience with Chinese MEP Order 7 and Decree 591, Korea REACH and CCA, Taiwan Tosca and OSHA, Japanese CSCL and AISHA, as well as Malaysian, Philippine, and Thai regulations. She is responsible for the expansion of Yordis Group's Asian business service provision through partners and for communication with international clients and partners. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Sophie. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, and thank you all for joining the webinar today. Um, so this webinar uh, is hosted by the AIHA, and it aims to provide an overview of chemical notification systems in China, Taiwan, and South Korea. Uh, as Kay mentioned, the uh, Yordesk Group was previously known uh, as the REACH Center, but we rebranded on the 1st of November this year. Um, however, we can continue to provide scientific and regulatory expertise to businesses man manufacturing and using chemicals, and we're a leading global company in this field. So our company has grown enormously, and it now provides a wide range of services, including Asian notification, North American notification, fireside, and services to the oil and gas industry as well. Our team has a wide range of expertise, comprising of uh, chemists, toxicologists, experts on risk assessment and exposure modeling. We also have a team of software engineers and data management scientists that take care of our chemical management system called ChemTrack. And we take, uh, undertake large data management projects as well um, to support businesses with setting up new business policies to help them um, meet the growing regulatory demand on, on businesses. And a growing area of our business is in global notification due to the need for industry to keep up with the growing amount of chemical re regulations being introduced worldwide. So my name is Sophie Guinard. I've been working at your desk group for two and a half years, and I currently support clients with obligations in Asia and the EU. Um, in particular, China, Korea, Taiwan, um, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. So today we're going to talk about the largest uh, chemical producing, some of the largest chemical producing countries in Asia, uh, China, Taiwan, and South Korea. For China, we will cover the obligations under the new substance regulation, MEP Order 7, and the hazardous chemical regulations that are under Decree 591. And for Taiwan, we'll look at the obligations under the Toxic Chemical Substance Control Act and the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Finally, for South Korea, we'll cover the Act on the Registration and Evaluation of Chemicals, or as it's currently known as, uh, commonly known as uh, K-REACH. And we'll also consider um, the recent revisions to K-REACH and how this may affect your business in future. During the presentation, we'll also talk a little bit about um, GHS requirements in each country. So we'll first start by considering China's chemical regulations, MEP Order 7 and Decree 591. This slide provides an overview of the key regulations on industrial chemicals in China. Um, specific groups are registered are regulated in China. For example, MEP Order 7 
um, regulates new substances, which may be classified as non-hazardous or hazardous substances. And the 3591 regulates hazardous substances, which may be new or existing. China GHS uh, applies to hazardous substances, but new substances which have been registered also have obligations to provide um, SDS and safety labels um, according to national standards. So this slide provides an overview of the key regulations on industrial chemicals in China. Uh, oh, sorry. So, so um, the MEP Order 7 is Chinese, China's regulation on new chemical substances. And it's the framework that bears the most resemblance to e the EU REACH regulation. Um, it came to force in 2010, and it describes the requirements for new chemical substance notification. So new substances are defined as those not listed on the Inventory of Existing Chemical Substances uh, in China, or the IECSC. This inventory contains around 45,000 substances, and over 8,000 entries don't have a CAS number, and 3,000 are confidential. Check whether the uh, one of your substances is on the confidential list, you need to do an inquiry um, that's made to the um, Solid Waste and Chemicals Management Centre in China. And manufacturers or importers of new substance need to submit a notification to the MEP SDC prior to manufacture or import into China. There is also no volume threshold for this. So in terms of the scope, uh, notification is required if new substances are manufactured on their own or as part of a mixture. Uh, they are raw, raw ingredients or intermediates used to produce medicines, veterinary, veterinary medicines, pesticides, um, and cosmetics, etc. If they're present in articles with intended release, for example, substances in ink cartridges, scented products, or firefighting equipment. Um, this is also similar to the requirements uh, for substances in Article under EU REACH. However, unlike EU REACH, where re registration of monomers is required, um, MEP Order 7, under MEP Order 7, you need to register the polymers. Um, and finally, intermediates or finished products with certain functions, such as surfactants, plasticizing agents, preservatives, um, and flame retardants, also require notification if they are new substances. So, in contrast, the following are exempt from MEP Order 7. Finished products that are um, managed by other regulations including China's cosmetic and pesticide regulations, are exempt. However, the raw materials of these products are not exempt. Um, naturally occurring substances, inc including unprocessed substances or those manufactured only by certain physical approaches, um, substances which have a non-commercial purpose or are unintentionally produced by a chemical reaction with environmental factors, such as air, and some other special categories detailed here. So this image shows the overall process for new substance notification in China. Uh, first of all, a search is performed to see whether the substance is listed on the IECSC. Uh, if the substance is found at this stage, then it can be treated uh, as an existing substance, and there's no need to notify it as a new substance. If the search returns no, no results at this stage, it might be uh, that the substance is on the confidential list. Um, and it's possible to check this by submitting an inquiry to the Solid Waste and Chemicals Management Center. The inquiry costs about uh, 450 US dollars and usually takes around two weeks to complete. 
So if the substance is not on the confidential list, again, no notification is required. Um, and if the, but if the chemical substance is not listed, um, there's still a potential that it could be exempt from no, the notification requirement. So exempted substances are detailed in Article 2 of the regulation. Um, and also in the NEP Order 7 guidance document. Um, so that's how you would check this. Um, however, if they're not exempt, then uh, these substances must go through the notification process. And the notifier must uh, determine which, which type of notification uh, needs to be carried out. And they must they need to submit a notification dossier to the MEP FCC before manufacture or import. Once the dossier is um, received, it needs to be evaluated, and that can either be accepted or rejected. Um, if it's accepted, a notification certificate is given, and the registrant needs to fulfil their post notification obligations. Um, after five years the new substance that's been notified will be added to the IECSC. Um, so it would then become an existing substance. So who can notify under NEP Order 7? The domestic, a domestic notifier can notify, um, and this is a manufacturer of a new substance in China or an importer of a new substance in China itself. Uh, these, can, these domestic notifiers can submit notifications on their own, or they can also appoint a Chinese representative agent to do this. A foreign notifier exports is an exporter of new substances to China, but they're not based in China themselves. And these, um, these companies have to appoint a Chinese representative agent notify a new chemical. And this is similar to uh, the role of only representative in the European Union. So please note that Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan um, also must appoint a representative agent uh, to carry out the notification. And the um, some changes to MEP Order 7 recently have uh, stated that the foreign or domestic notifier is the registration certificate holder, not the only representative. So there are three types, three main notification types under MEP Order 7. The first is Scientific Record Notification, or SRN. Uh, these are substances used for research and development with an annual, report, uh, annual volume of under 0.1 tonnes per year. Or um, for substance samples that are to be tested in ecotoxicology labs in China. The uh, updated guidance for new substance notification, which is still in its draft form, has clarified that there is a minimum threshold for SRM notification of 10 kilograms. A year. Um, however, this isn't this guidance isn't in force yet, so at the moment it remains at zero. For SRN, there are no testing requirements, but you do need to submit an SRN form and some basic research information. The second type is simplified notification, and this is required uh, for the notification of new substances manufactured or imported under one ton per year. There are two types of this, general and special conditions. Uh, general substance is manufactured or imported at less than one ton per year, and it includes all new substances uh, unless they meet the criteria for a special condition. The special condition applies to the following categories. So isolated intermediates, research and development uh, between 0.1 and one ton per year, uh, substances for export from China only, polymers of low concern, and polymers containing total new polymers at less than 2% weight to weight of the polymer. 
And finally, for substances uh, for process development, a higher tonnage threshold of up to 10 tonnes per year over a period of no more than two years can be registered under special conditions. Data requirements for simplified general condition are a simplified notification form, some physical chemical data, and a test report for a small number of ecotoxicology tests that need to be carried out in MEP approved labs in China. And the requirements for simplified special condition are a simplified notification form and documentary evidence for using this special condition type. So, for example, for polymers, compositional information would need to be uh, submitted. And the final um, notification type is regular, uh, regular notification. This is for new substances manufactured or imported uh, above, at or above one ton per year. So there are four tonnage bands for this, up to a thousand tons per year. Um, companies manufacturing uh, between 1 and 10 tonnes uh, of a new substance must complete a level 1. For 10 to 100, it's a level 2. For 100 to 1,000, it's a level 3. And 1,000 plus, it's level 4. And the data requirements are highest for, uh, for regular notification. And these requirements increase with increases in tonnage. So generally, uh, regular notification requires the notification form, submission of physical chemical data, toxicology data, which includes human and ecotoxicology data, uh, classification and labeling, a risk assessment report, and uh, Chinese database sheet and label as well. Only substances notified through this uh, regular notification pathway will be added to the IECSP in China. Simplified notification and SRN will not lead to um, inclusion in the Chinese inventory, so they, they would remain new substances. So for all, for all these notification types, there are a number of post-notification obligations. For scientific record notification, these are to employ risk management measures and using specialized facilities. Um, and although there are, there are subject to fewer requirements than other notification types, SRN notifiers must still comply with regulations on the disposal of dangerous waste and other relevant regulations. Simplified notification, the notifier must to, uh, submit an annual report to, uh, detailing volumes of the substance manufactured or imported, risk management measures, uh, environmental exposures, etc. And they must keep um, a record of the notification materials and information on manufacture and import for at least 10 years post notification. And regular, regular notifiers must communicate the SDS and classification and labeling information to downstream users. They need to implement the risk management measures. Um, and importantly, also, they need to prevent transferring these chemicals to downstream users that lack the ability to implement these risk management measures. So regular notifiers must submit a first activity report to the MEP FEC when the substance is manufactured for the first time or transferred to downstream user for the first time. And again, uh, regular notifiers need to keep records on file for 10 years and need to notify, if, uh, notify again if the hazard, change, hazard status changes or the tonne changes. So we'll go on to briefly discuss Decree 591 on the regulation regulation of safe management of hazardous chemicals. China's legal framework for managing hazardous chemicals is actually quite complex. Um, it's un enforced under a number of different regulations and inventories. And the overarching law on hazardous chemical control is Decree 591 which was introduced in 2011. 
This is supported by some ministerial uh, regulations that help to implement the aims of this decree 591. And the ministerial regulations include Sorts Order 53, 41, um, 55 and 57. There are registration requirements under Sorts Order 53. Um, and permitting and licensing requirements under Source Order 41, 55 and 57. And all of these requirements need to be completed by Chinese-based companies. The non-Chinese manufacturer or formulator can't actually complete these um, and they can't, also, they can't appoint an only representative um, to fulfil these requirements. So some hazardous substances are prioritised through their inclusion onto different catalogues or lists, such as the catalogue of hazardous chemicals, which is shown in the far left box. Um, the catalogue of hazardous chemicals is also a mandatory classification list in China, so please bear this in mind when you're classifying your substances uh, for the Chinese market. So the definition of a hazardous substance is also given at the bottom of the slide, and this um, the uh, decree 591 has also um, implemented the globally harmonised system of classification and labelling, or GHS, in China. And so uh, decree 591 is applicable to all these substances that are classified as hazardous according to GHS. The following slides just summarise the different levels of hazardous chemical management in China. Um, starting with the white outer circle, there are non-hazardous, uh, these are non-hazardous chemicals which aren't regulated by Decree 591 at all. The dark blue circle shows chemicals uh, including substances and mixtures with GHS classification. And these, these include those with less severe hazard classification, such as acute toxicity 4 and 5. These are regulated by Decree 591 and China GHS. The lighter blue circle. Uh, sorry, so the lighter blue circle shows a chemical Hi, that has... Sophie. Sorry, Sophie, yes. this is Kay. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, your voice is uh, fading in and out just a little bit. Um, we we're wondering, are you able to speak up just a little bit or perhaps dial in differently? Yes, sure. I'll, uh, I'll try and speak up. And if there's any, if any problem, maybe, uh, maybe I can dial in differently. Um, okay, yeah, um, maybe, yeah, either perhaps speaking up just a little bit. Um, I think you're dialed in uh, on your computer, correct? That's right, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I guess um, if you want to just try speaking up a little bit, um, we can try that um, if that works better. For okay. You. okay. Okay, thank you, sure. Sophie. Sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. Right, so the, um, the lighter blue circle shows chemicals that have a more severe GHS classification, um, such as acute toxicity 1, 2, or 3, uh, but the, they are not listed on the catalogue of hazardous chemicals. Um, these substances need to comply with Decree 591, GHS, and hazard, uh, hazardous chemical registration under SOARS Order 53. The grey circle uh, inside shows mixtures where at least 70% of the components are listed on the catalogue of hazardous chemicals. Um, these mixtures and single chemicals listed on the uh, CHD have obligations under Decree 591, China GHS, and regulation, regulatory obligations under SOARS Order 53. Uh, they also have licensing obligations uh, under SOARS Order 41, 55, and 57. And certain chemicals on the 
THC are further categorised as toxic chemicals, which have additional licensing and permitting obligations under MCS Order 77. So the white chemicals do not need to be registered under the CRE 591 and substances in the dark blue group only need to comply with GHS. For substances in the light blue group, the main requirements are to comply with GHS and to undergo hazardous chemical registration according to SOARS Order 53. The grey group of substances and the smaller circles have the highest requirements um, which include GHS compliance, um, have chem registration and licensing as well. So as well as registering substances, companies using hazardous chemicals in China need to ensure that they get the appropriate licensing and permitting. Um, so for, for example, for Chinese manufacturers, a production license is needed uh, and for Chinese importers, an operation license would be needed. Um, although these other stakeholders aren't able to register chemicals, they st may still need to uh, obtain licenses. So we'll now move, out, move on to uh, discuss China's GHS system uh, and the standards implementing GHS in China. China implements the fourth revision of UN GHS, and we'll talk about what that means uh, in the next few slides. So safety data sheet and labelling according to China GHS um, is required if the substance uh, or mixture is classified as hazardous according to Chinese national standards on uh, classification. And if a substance is a new substance, one of the post notification obligations is to provide an SDF and labels for, uh, for this substance. The um, SDS and labels also need to be provided if the substance is a, trans is a dangerous good and if the substance is listed in, a cert in certain AQ, FIQ announcements uh, which are provided by customs. China's GHS system, like the hazardous chemical system, is actually implemented through a number of different different documents, different standards. Um, these, may, these can be mandatory uh, or recommended. So the uh, national standard for classification is, the, is called the General Rule for Classification and Hazard Communication of Chemicals. This, um, as well as this, there are uh, 28 UCD standards which corresponds to the 28 categories of uh, chemical hazards. And these adopted all of the building blocks of UN GHS uh, revision 4, including uh, aspiration hazards, uh, hazards for the ozone layer and uh, acute, toxi acute toxicity category 5, for example. This, uh, this table just provides a broad uh, comparison of the classification under China GHS and the, um, and the US equivalent, US HCS uh, 2012. You can see that a number of hazard classifications aren't adopted in HCS 2012, but uh, China also doesn't adopt pyrophoric gases category 2, category 1, uh, simple asphyxiants and combustible dust. Um, in addition, there are differences in the acute toxicity thermal uh, category 1 ATE and differences in the con concentration limits for reproductive toxicity and specific uh, target organ toxicity classification. For labelling packaging of chemicals, the the standard is the general rules for the pre preparation of precautionary labels for chemicals. Uh, the label requirements are quite similar to those under other countries' GHS systems, and it includes the chemical identification, pictograms, uh, signal words, uh, hazard statements, precautionary statements, and supplier identification. 
However, um, the label must be in Chinese and a Chinese 24 hour emergency number must be provided. Uh, the requirements for label formats and sizes also differ from EU and US GHS systems. Hey, Sophie, it's Regina. Are you going to pause and try that uh, dial-in option for us? I think she's going to try the dial-in -in option. Great. So if everyone just, um, we would just appreciate your patience just for a moment. We're going to see if we can get uh, Sophie hooked up to a phone so that we can hear this presentation much better. So if you just give us a moment, let her switch her audio. I'm going to walk her through how to do that real quick. So thank you for your patience. Um, Sophie, you can just go ahead and go up to the left corner of your screen where it says communicate and click your communicate option. And then you're going to select audio connection. And you're going to switch your audio from your phone to the computer. So just go ahead and disconnect from your computer. Just select communicate at the very top left of your screen, audio connection, disconnect audio. Sophie, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. You can chat to me if you'd like in your chat module. Hello, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Sounds great. All right, we'll continue okay. with the presentation. Kation, thank you so much for doing that for us. Thank you. So apologies for the uh, sound uh, problem there. Hopefully you can now all hear me. Uh, Properly. Um, I'll just pick up where I left off uh, before. Uh, so the, we've now moved on to safety data sheet um, uh, authoring. So there are two recommended standards in place for this. There's safety data sheets for chemical products content and order of sections and the guidance on compilation of safety data sheets for chemical products. And as well as communicating information on hazard properties, safety data sheets must include information on handling, storage, disposal, transport, and emergency response and rescue. So section 15 must also include regulatory information, such as um, whether the substance or mixture is regulated under the following regulations. Uh, the Occupational Disease Prevention Law, the Regulation on Safe Management of Hazardous Chemicals, the 3591, and the, uh, also MEP Order 7, which is as we discussed earlier. These uh, SDS must be written in simplified Chinese, 
and they must include a domestic 24-hour emergency phone number. So next to cover is Taiwan, and today we'll talk about the uh, Toxic Chemical Toxic Chemical Substance Control Act and the Occupational Safety and Health Act. The uh, Tox Toxic Chemical Substance Control Act, or TOSCA as it's known, was significantly revised on the, uh, in December 2014 by the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. And OSHA was announced on uh, the 1st of January 2015, and this was announced by the Ministry of Labor um, in Taiwan. These regulations have a different focus. So the uh, TOSCA aims to prevent toxic substances from polluting the environment and from endangering human health. This, um, whereas OSHA um, focuses on uh, enhancing sound man management of chemicals in the workplace in Taiwan. So the, we'll start with uh, considering the Taiwan Chemical Substance Inventory, or TCSI. Uh, this inventory contains over 100,000 chemicals, and a large number of these were added to the inventory through uh, existing chemical substance nomination and some sub supplementary existing chemical substance nominations, where industry had a chance to, to add their chemicals to this list. Um, some of these were confidential nominations, so they've remained confidential in the list. And under TOSCA, existing substances above a certain threshold um, were subject to phase one registration, which is now finished. This was uh, quite similar to pre-registration under EU REACH. Um, and then during the sec second phase of, of registration, Existing substances are prioritized for registration in batches. New substances which aren't listed on the TCI, uh, TCSI have reg uh, registration requirements under both TOSCA and OSHA, re regardless of the tonnage they're manufactured or imported in. So five years after a registration is accepted for under TOSCA and OSHA, these um, get added to the TCSI, and then they are considered existing. The Taiwanese EPA has recently launched um, a single unit window um, to submit both new and existing chemical registration. Um, even though the EPA and um, the Ministry of Labor review these uh, regis registrations under TOSCA and OSHA separately. Um, they are going to move to jointly reviewing these dossiers, which should streamline the process. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the, the inventory contains around 100,000 substances. These have been updated a number of times, and the inventory is in traditional Chinese and English format. Um, you can search by cast name, Chinese name, or English name, or serial number. So it is possible to, that new substances are still exempt from registration. Um, as seen in the top left blue box, um, it may be that the substances are fall under special chemical types and usage, um, or it may be that they're so-called regular substances. Regular new substances can be subject to small quantity, simplified or standard registration, and these substances must be registered uh, and the registration approved before manufacture or import. Registered substances are assessed and further managed by TOSCA and OSHA. For existing um, substances in the TCSI, if they're manufactured or imported 
uh, above 0.1 tonnes per year or 100 kilograms per year, they are subject to phase one registration, which is uh, similar to pre-registration under each. The, these are like further certain substances are um, designated for full registration based on their hazardous properties and tonnage and uses as well. And the companies manufacturing these designated substances uh, need to register them before set deadlines. So who can register chemical substances in Taiwan? The system here is a bit different to the situation in China or South Korea. Um, in Taiwan, there's no only representative option for non-Taiwanese companies. So only a Taiwanese manufacturer, importer, or third-party representative can submit the notification to the EPA. Um, in order to protect CBI, a uh, foreign company may choose to uh, for a third party representative to carry out the notification. Uh, in this case, the importers would need to, the importer or the manufacturer would need to appoint the third party representative through a notarization process. So we'll now just talk specifically about Tosca. TOSCA regulates specific groups of substances, uh, including toxic substances, which are those that are intentionally produced by human activity or unintentionally derived from production processes. And they've been uh, officially given a rating of class one, two, three, or four um, by the EPA. And these can be restricted, uh, controlled, or prohibited from handling. Existing substances, as we've mentioned, are those listed on the TSCI. And companies manufacturing a specific volume need to submit a registration to the EPA before a certain deadline. New substances are those not listed on the inventory, and these need to these are subject to registration um, at the latest 90 days before manufacture or import. So the, um, there are a number of substances that are exempt. We've seen some of these before in the China section of the webinar, but some are unique to Taiwan. For example, uh, chemical substances accompanied in machines and equipment for test run purpose. Uh, these include things like lubricants and solvents that are present in the equipment. Uh, however, if, if for example, um, equipment is manually operated and the um, equipment needs to be replaced, so for example, the lubricant in the machine needs to be replaced, this replacement lubricant wouldn't be exempt from registration. So in terms of who are the registrants, the registrants in Thailand can, uh, in Taiwan, sorry, can only be um, the Taiwanese manufacturer, importer, or an imp appointed um, Taiwanese third-party representative that has been formally notarized by um, by the importer or manufacturer. This is a, a decision flowchart which helps to determine the registration obligations. So um, you would first need to decide whether your substance is existing or not. And if it is, um, you, if it is existing, uh, the, and the annual quantity is above 100 kilograms per year, then a phase one registration uh, would be required. Then if a substance becomes designated and is published on a de designated substance list, and you're above the threshold tonnage for this, then registration would be necessary before the set deadline. Registrations uh, need to be approved before handling, and registrants need to uh, fulfill post-registration obligations for this. Uh, if the substance is new, 
uh, as it is on this left hand uh, part of the, of the decision tree. Uh, it's necessary to check whether it's exempt and um, or whether some reduced obligations apply. Yeah, if, if these don't apply, then you would need to just determine the registration type and you would also need to submit registration and gain approval before manufacture or import. Again, um, post notification obligations would apply here. So designated existing substances will be announced in batches and the information requirements for the designated existing substances are shown here. In terms of deadlines, the phase one registration deadline uh, was March 2016 um, and following this, the EPA reviewed the information submitted as part of phase one registration and they decided on a list of designated existing chemicals. Um, so that they could prioritize these for registration. The first batch of existing designated chemicals uh, has been published in its draft form uh, and it's expected to be published in its finalized form in, uh, on the 31st of December this year. So phase um, one registration was carried out between September 2015 and March 2016. Um, for, for phase one registration, the following information needs to be submitted. Registr registrants information, substance identity, quantity manufactured or imported, and usage information. Taiwan, um, each Taiwan importer needs to do this submission individually. And note that there's no CBI option at this stage. However, limited information can be obtained from a phase one registration number. And the deadline for this was the 31st of March 2016. And if companies manufacture or import above, at or above 100 kilograms per year after this date, they can still apply for a late phase one registration. Uh, within a deadline specified by the EPA. However, um, if, if the company has been uh, importing over 100 kilograms per year uh, before April 1st, 2016, um, there may be some penalty in place. So we do know of a company who's, uh, who this applied to and they, uh, they were uh, fines, but it's a, a small fine uh, from the EPA. There is a range that is um, a range of fines applicable, and the EPA did give the lower end of the range on this occasion, which was approximately a thousand US dollars per substance per importer. For phase two registration, um, there are batches of designated or priority existing chemicals. Um, the first batch contained 122 chemicals in the draft version, and the final version of that list is expected at the end of this year. The registrations for this um, need to be submitted by uh, 2021. This slide uh, summarizes the, the different tonnage bands and requirements for different groups uh, of new substances. So you should be able to see that um, for CMR category one, there are significant requirements above naught kilograms per year. Um, whereas for general new substances in the middle, these uh, substances can benefit from a small quantity registration and simplified registration below one ton per year. So groups such as uh, substances used for process and uh, product-orientated research and development, PFOD, or on-site 
isolated intermediates, the OSII, um, and polymers could potentially uh, benefit from reduced registration requirements as well in certain tonnage bands. Uh, for polymers of low concern, registration isn't required below one ton per year, but a confirmation of this is necessary. So OSHA, as I mentioned, has a slightly different focus to TOSCA, and it was enacted to protect workers' safety and health um, and pre prevent occupational accidents as well. The, this summarizes the requirements under OSHA. The new substances uh, need to be registered before manufacture or import. Controlled chemicals are banned from manufacture import supply um, unless a permit has been obtained. And priority management chemicals are subject to mand mandatory reporting of handling information. In addition, there are obligations for hazardous chemicals. Um, they need to fully comply with classification labeling and SDS requirements in Taiwan. Uh, and employers need to assess risks based on hazard to health, uh, distribution, quantity of use, etc. And for chemicals with permissible ex exposure workplace limits, they need to, the employers need to make sure that they comply with these in the workplace. This slide just uh, summarizes the type of uh, new chemical substance registration under OSHA, which is very similar to those under TOSCA. Um, it also summarizes the data requirements for these as well. And these are increasing uh, as the tonnages increase. So this shows the different levels of control in Taiwan with the uh, existing substances um, subject to the least control uh, and chemicals classified as hazardous according to Taiwan GHS uh, subject to uh, slightly more control. So uh, these contain, it's estimated this is uh, 19, around 19,000 substances with trigger the DHS classification. Um, then chemicals of priority management and controlled chemicals are subject to even more control under OSHA. Uh, just as a note, at the bottom uh, it states that Taiwan has fully implemented GHS in 2016, so now SDS and labels that go to Taiwan should be according to these standards. So OSHA um, describes obligations for classification, labeling, packaging, and SDS. Um, in terms of classification, the main standard is Taiwan's GHS standard, uh, CNS 15030. Uh, this is aligned to UN uh, DHS revision 4. And the Ministry of Labor also released some guidelines to help comply with this standard. Employers um, must also label, make inventories, and display SDS for hazardous chemicals according to OSHA, and adopt necessarily, necessary hazard communication measures. When any of this information changes, these also need to be updated. And for SDS, the manufacturers and Im importers, suppliers, or employers um, must carry, that, carry out the um, a check on the accuracy of the SDS, um, and these need to be uh, updated at least once every three years. This table compares uh, classification under Taiwan GHS and US HDS. A number of classifications are not adopted. Um, however, like China, Taiwan doesn't uh, adopt pyrophoric gas um, category 1, simple asphyxiant, and combustible dust. There are also um, 
differences in acute toxicity, dermal category one, ATE, and differences in uh, concentration limits for reprotox um, substances and differences in concentration limits for specific target organ toxicity classifications. So for SDS and labeling, these need to be in traditional Chinese language, and the H statement must be according to the standardized system described in the regulation of labeling and hazard classification uh, of hazardous chemicals. The label on SDS needs to include a 24-hour emergency number, and in se section 16, the name, company, and um, person of the uh, person who prepared the SDS needs to be described. Uh, SDS needs to be updated every three years and retained for a minimum of three years. And finally, color pictograms are required for SDS and label. Uh, OSHA has issued some recommended classifications. Uh, for around 9,000 hazardous substances. And most of these are actually consistent with Annex 6 of CLP. The list was, uh, is continually, continually updated, um, but there is no, um, it's not an obligatory classification list, it's uh, recommended. So the final section of this webinar will cover the acts on the registration, evaluation, et cetera, of uh, chemical substances. Uh, this is more commonly known as K-REACH um, due to its similarity of, uh, to EU-REACH. So this entered into force in January 2015, and it concerns um, registration, annual reporting, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals. However, we're going to focus today on registration and annual reporting only. Um, registration is required for new substances, uh, and there's no threshold tonnage for these new substances, and priority existing chemicals manufactured or imported at or above one ton per year. So this slide shows the regulatory obligations for substances on their own uh, or in a mixture under K-REACH. So to start with annual reporting, this is, um, this is required for both existing chemicals manufactured or imported uh, at or above one ton per year, and also for new chemical substances um, and there's no volume limit for the new substances. So in addition, two groups of substances need to be registered. Uh, these are existing chemical substances subject to registration and new chemical substances, again, of which there's no volume limit. Um, so, uh, these substances need to be registered, um, and after this, they undergo hazard assessment by the Korean authorities. During this um, process, additional information may be requested if deemed necessary from the hazard evaluation stage. Um, risk assessment is also required for substances manufactured or imported at or above 10 tons per year, or if um, if, if found to be necessary during hazard assessment. So depending on uh, the tonnage, um, companies that register these chemicals may be able to benefit from extended deadlines to submit their risk assessment report. So the main registration is submitted um, ahead of the risk assessment report. The hazard assessment process might have the outcome of a substance um, being designated as toxic 
or it could lead to substances being restricted or authorised. So in addition to the requirements for substances, there are also requirements for um, hazardous substances in products. We're not really going to cover these in detail, but um, in a similar way to um, how substances of very high concern in our schools are regulated under REACH, product notification is needed if the hazardous chemical substance is above one ton per year and is above a percentage threshold concentration in the product. Uh, often this percentage threshold is 0.1%, but it can actually depend on the, on the chemical substance. And um, once the Ministry of Environment risk, risk assesses chemicals, they also publish a list of risk concern products, and they also detail the safety and labeling criteria for these substances, which industry needs to comply with. This, um, this slide just summarizes the main exclusions from K-REACH, including pharmaceutical products, cosmetics, raw materials for cosmetics, food and feed add additives, and medical devices as well. So for some exempted substances, it's not actually sufficient to keep a record of why you would believe the substance to be exempt. Um, you may need to actually submit an application for com confirmation of exemption uh, from registration to the KCMA um, and gain confirmation from the authorities that it is actually exempt. So this um, this differs in a, in a lot, of, lot of ways from other regulatory programs around the world. This needs to be done for substances used in scientific experiments and research, uh, non-isolated intermediate, substances used for research and development, and chemicals that are formed by reacting functional groups on the surface of a substance which is subject to surface treatment with another substance. This uh, slide just clarifies the criteria for polymers of low concern and also explains when polymers can't be exempted. We'll look at now who, who can actually register under K-REACH. Um, and in a similar way to EU REACH and to China, MEP or the 7, only South Korean companies can actually register substances under K-REACH. So if a foreign company has a legal entity in Korea, then that's great. The entity can potentially complete the registration. But if not, the foreign company, um, if they're a manufacturer or formulator, can appoint a Korean-only representative to submit the registration. And only, um, as I said, only manufacturers or formulators outside of Korea can submit, the, can appoint an only representative. This slide just summarizes the key supply chain requirements for substances on their own or in mixtures. So for Korean manufacturers, importers, or only representatives appointed by a foreign company, if they manufacture or import a new substance or at least one ton of a priority existing substance, they need to register this uh, with the NIER. Once this is complete, the government uh, issues a registration certificate and notice of registration. And um, then to so to the downstream industrial users, the registrant needs to provide a confirmation of the registration, including the registration number and a description of chemical safety information. It's also necessary to provide Korean SDS to downstream users, and the downstream users have um, the right to request this information, and they would need the registrant would need to provide this within a month of them asking. 
this um, just shows the process of determining whether a registration is required or not. So the first step is to check whether the substance is excluded from the scope of uh, AREC. Um, the, if a substance is exclusively covered under a different law, then the substance needs uh, must be, um, be registered according to that law, and not under K-REACH. Uh, it's also relevant to check whether your product meets the definition of a chemical substance. If not, if the chemical registration wouldn't be required. Um, but if it is, then you may need to check whether it's a new or priority existing chemical. If it is, then you'd need to check which tonnage band the substance falls into. Um, and for priority existing chemicals imported or manufactured above one ton per year and the new substances uh, imported at any tonnage, uh, registration needs to be submitted. But the uh, substance still may be exempt from the registration requirement, so this is the final step. Um, if it's not exempt, then registration would be required. Then after a re registration certificate received, it would be possible to manufacture or import the substance in the specified tonnage band. You'd need to update the registration if a change in tonnage band use or hazard uh, applies. And you'd need to also fulfill post notification obligations. So annual reporting requires, uh, applies to existing substances manufactured or imported at or above one ton per year. Um, and also to new substances. Like registration, uh, annual reporting requires an only representative to be uh, to be uh, appointed by the foreign company. And basic information is required for the this annual reporting, um, such as importer's company name, contact information, information on the chemical, Cast number, use category, and whether the users are industrial, professional, or consumers. The first deadline for this was the 30th of June 2016. And note that the um, revisions to K-REACH means that annual reporting will actually no longer be um, a requirement once the amendments come into force. Many companies exporting products to South Korea will come across this letter of confirmation document, um, maybe because a Korean uh, customer has asked them to complete it before exporting the product. And this is because the Korean importer needs to fill in a confirmation letter um, for chemical substances to the KCMA prior to import. Um, the to do this, the importer uses the information provided by the foreign manufacturer or formulator um, on the letter of confirmation. Companies need to indicate whether the substances in their mixture are subject to more specific regulatory control. Um, for example, if the substance is a designated existing substance, a new substance, a toxic substance, etc. CBI protection is only available for new chemical substances and priority existing chemical substances. Another requirement um, following registration is the transfer of chemical safety information to downstream users at the time of transferring or prior to transferring the product. Um, this slide just summarizes the information required for this. And I mentioned early on in the webinar that a number of significant amendments will be made to uh, K-REACH. These were announced by MOE Notice 2016-869. So the following are the, the main changes to the regulation. I mentioned before that annual reporting will be abolished once new K-REACH comes into force. 
and for new substances at the lowest tonnage band, registration requirement is going to be replaced with notification, which will definitely ease obligations for companies which have um, new substances in this lowest, lowest tonnage band, um, because at the moment there's no threshold and it can be difficult to enforce um, or manufacture and scale up in, in this area. Uh, instead of registration only applying to designated or priority existing chemicals, it will apply to about 7,000 existing chemicals um, manufactured or imported above a tonne per year. And a pre-registration system is going to be set up for these substances. The scope for notification of products containing hazardous substances will be expanded and the communication of hazard information will be strengthened and broadened. There's also going to be stricter controls for substances subject to authorization. However, currently in Korea, there are no substances subject to authorization. These haven't been announced yet. Um, but once they are, there will be um, stricter controls for these. Uh, finally, some new penalties will be introduced as well. So the new deadlines to consider for amended K-REACH are, um, so there is an existing deadline already of the 30th of June 2018 for 510 priority existing chemicals at or above one ton per year. Um, and the new K-REACH will introduce four registration deadlines for existing substances uh, in 2021. 24, 27, and 30, based on the substance tonnages. New substance registration will still need to be carried out, um, but these will, um, registration itself will only apply at or above 100 kilograms per year, and this will need to be done before manufacture and import. And the deadline for the submission of chemical safety reports for PEX may still be in place, however, um, it's not really clear what what these deadlines are yet, um, according to the changes. So, to summarize um, the changes to K-REACH, existing substances uh, will now be subject to pre-registration. Um, and registration before phase in, before certain phase in deadlines. And new substances above 100 kilograms per year will be subject to registration before manufacture or import. These substances are subject to registration, hazard assessment, and risk assessment as they were before. And they may be designated as toxic, authorized, or restricted substances. For products, the obligations um, for products of risk concern have been moved into the new Korean Biocidal Products Regulation um, and other regulations, but there are still requirements for product notification uh, for risk concern products, sorry, for risk concern substances uh, contained above threshold concentrations in the product. The regulations um, that are most important for GHS implementation in Korea are the Chemical Control Act, the um, OSHA, and Hazardous Man Materials Act. And the key standard is MOEL 2016-19. This latter standard came into effect from the 6th of April 2016, and this new standard aligns with GHS Revision 4. So companies authoring SDS need to use um, mandatory harmonized classifications that are published by the NIER um, and also the classification for CMR substances published by MOEL. South Korea doesn't adopt all the building blocks of GHS Revision 4. Uh, there is, so there are some um, quite significant differences with classification in South Korea and US HCS 2012, um, as seen here. 
Uh, in addition to these, there are some differences in the acute toxicity dermal category 1AT and um, in, in the carcinogenicity concentration limit for mixtures, um, for which category 2 is 1% um, in South Korea compared to category 2 being 0.1% um, in the US. Um, there's also some differences in the reproductive toxicity concentration limit and um, for specific target organ toxicity as well. So for labeling, the following needs to be included. Uh, product identifier being consistent with the SDS, a signal word, pictograms of up to four pictograms, um, hazard statements and repeated statements can be admitted here where and similar statements combined. Precautionary statements of up to six. Um, then if if there are more um a sentence pointing to the pointing the user to the SDS for full statements should be included. Supplier information, uh the language needs to be in Korean and there are some uh requirements for small packaging as well. Korea uses the 16 uh, section SDS, um, but the SDS needs to be prepared in Korean. And um, the, um, so for certain uh, uses, such as um, used solely in test and research laboratories, the SDS wouldn't need to be translated. Um, for section three, there are um, the concentration for ingredients can be indicated in the form of ranges. And section 15, specific Korean regulatory information needs to be provided, such as information on the Industrial health, Safety and Health Act, uh, Toxic Chemical Control Act, dangerous material. Safety Control Act uh, and Waste Management Act and some other requirements as well. It's uh, necessary to include either presence or absence on these reg regulatory lists and inventories and also uh, information on the thresholds that trigger obligations. So this final slide just provides a, a comparison of the different regulations. they are different responsible authorities and their scope. Uh, including who can register, when registration is required, etc. Um, it also summarizes the different types of registration and when um, when a risk assessment is a uh, risk assessment report is required. I won't go into too much detail here, um, it's more for your reference, but the main differences between the regulation are the scope of regulations in different countries. For example, MEP Order 7 only regulates new substances, not existing ones. TOSCA regulates new substances and existing substances um, designated as subject to registration, as well as toxic substances. Uh, Taiwan's OSHA regulates new controlled priority management, hazard, hazardous chemicals, and chemicals with exposure workplace limits. And South Korea's KREACH regulation currently regulates new substances and existing uh, designated substances, but will soon move on to regulating all existing substances above one ton per year. Um, there are other differences in who can register. Uh, in Taiwan, there's a third party representative system, um, but in China and Korea, there's an only representative system. And the general theme is that new substances require registration before manufacture and import, whereas uh, designated existing substances often have phase, phase in deadlines. There are also options for small volume or simplified registration for certain substances or tonnages. And there are um, differences as well in the risk assessment report um, when they are required. So that brings us to the end of our uh, of the webinar. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I would like to 
now open uh, for questions. And uh, yes, so over to Kate. Okay. Great. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, it looks like we have uh, just about 10 minutes left for questions. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Uh, we already have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, are there specific requirements on laboratory samples between universities? i.e. for research, is there a math limit that the NSCN would not be required? And how long does it take to submit these permits? All right, thank you for the question. Um, so I'm uh, assuming that the transfer between universities is from a non-Chinese uh, university to a Chinese university. Um, in which case, uh, it would still be considered as import, um, import of a, a new substance, potentially. Um, and if, if that is above naught um, kilograms per year, then uh, you would need to do the um, scientific research notification for the transfer of these samples. Um, it is quite a, a quick uh, notification to carry out. It, it usually takes about two weeks um, and there are quite minimal registration requirements. But yeah, you, you, if, if it's import, if it um, consists of import or manufacture of any substance, then you would need to do a notification. Okay. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, I did get clarification via chat um, that this uh, question they were looking uh, from the USA to China for that question. Um, right. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, the next question comes from John, who asks if a U.S. company exports their chemical to China and it is on the Chinese inventory, does the U.S. manufacturer have to obtain a license, or is that the responsibility of the Chinese importer to obtain that license? Right. So, um, yeah. So, if it's on the existing substance inventory, it wouldn't require new substance notification. Um, if the substance is hazardous, um, according to the same hazard categories that are adopted by the catalog of hazardous chemicals in China, then you would um, potentially need to. Um, the substance may need to be registered and may require hazardous chemical licensing, but it is the Chinese company um, responsible for import that would need to do that. Um, the U.S. company can't, can't um, apply for permitting um, and licensing in China. Okay, great. Thanks, Sophie. Our next question comes from Heather. She asks, um, does the China domestic 24-hour emergency number have to be provided by NRCC via contract, or is there another option for manufacturers and importers? So the um, domestic 24-hour number, it, it can be through other companies. It, doesn't, it does not have to be provided through the NRCC. Um, it just needs to be a number that's located within China and is 24 hours. So there are um, companies that, more and more companies that are offering this service of the emergency 24 hour number and they have offices in a number of different countries. So it, as far as I know, it is also possible to use these companies. Okay, great. Uh, our next question comes from Eileen. Uh, she asks, in your experience, are the regulations in these countries as strict as U.S. regulations or less strict? Um, in, it's a good question. Um, the, I think in terms of the written uh, regulatory text, the uh, requirements are, there are more requirements and they are on paper a lot stricter than um, the U.S. regulations. Um, however, in terms of enforcement for certain jurisdictions, it, it does seem like the enforcement is is not always there. Um, however, 
for example, in South Korea, the enforcement is very strict from our experience. Um, the even uh, there are lots of audits of only representatives, and there are um, uh, officers that come in to inspect safety data sheets uh, in Korean companies. So we, I found that uh, Korea is very strict. Um, Taiwan is also they do enforce penalties and they do check, and there is a move to um, kind of get information from customs to check the, whether chemicals have been registered or not. That may happen in the future. Um, but at the moment in China, it's, uh, it, there's less enforcement there. Um, although there are companies that do experience problems at customs and um, trying to actually get their products into uh, China, uh, but in terms of the registration um, enforcement, was probably less than South Korea and Taiwan. Okay, great. Uh, so our next question is, if a foreign company exports to multiple sites in China, are multiple HASCAM registrations requ required? Uh, yes, so um, the each importer needs to do the uh, hazardous chemical registration individually. Um, this actually differs from the new substance notification under MEP Order 7. So under MEP Order 7, you, for the foreign company can appoint the only representative and choose to cover all of the importers, but for hazardous chemical registration, each importer needs to do the registration. Okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, our next question uh, I have is, you mentioned that the more severe hazard classifications are subject to hazardous chemical registration. Uh, what are the more severe hazard classifications? Um, so the, um, the more severe hazard classifications are those that are adopted by the catalog of hazardous chemicals. Um, and so if, if substances or mixtures are classified to this, these hazard categories, uh, then they would require hazard, hazardous chemical registration. Um, there are, it's probably easier to talk about the ones that aren't, or the less severe hazard classifications than the more severe hazard classifications, but um, there are the categories that are not included on the catalog of hazardous chemicals include uh, acute toxicity four and five, um, I think skin irritants category three and um, hazard, uh, the aquatic acute category three and aquatic chronic category four, among some okay, others. Great. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, I think we have time for just one last question. Uh, so okay. that one is, um, is there a mandatory classification list in Taiwan? Um, no, um, so there there is a classification list um, in Taiwan, but it's uh, just a recommended list. Um, this, yeah, there's no obligation to use these classifications, and the industry can choose to self-classify if they if they want to. Okay, um, great. Yeah. Thank you. It's not clear whether there there may be a mandatory list published in future, but for the moment, it's not. Okay, great. Thank you, Sophie. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, Sophie has offered to field any questions that we were unable to get to today via email. Uh, we appreciate all of these good questions. Uh, my thanks to Sophie for her presentation, to Yordis Group for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our listeners. Please be on the lookout for announcements of future Synergis webinars. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, for the attendees for listening today.